Hello there, I'm Nicole Dementry, and this is a special edition of Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Alexis Scott. This hour, we are featuring stories produced by students in the Master Storytelling class here at the Newhouse School, taught by professors Bob Dotson and Les Rose. And our first story for you today, gun violence is a hotly debated and divisive issue. Many people focus on gun control or improved mental health programs as a solution. But Mornings on the Hill, Stefan Olivia has the story of how one Syracuse man has a different approach to the issue. Donnell McGrew commutes to two jobs where he works more than 60 hours each week. He supports 10 kids. I love my babies, but I'm tired of being broke. <laughs> That's why he works on Fayette Street, where several of his family members were killed in one year when he was a teenager. I lost a lot. A lot to nothing. I'm for nothing. He's looking after all those who wander this street on the east side of Syracuse, where he was raised. Why are you outside and all this cold? Oh, What's going on with you? McGrew was caught with a loaded gun and served nearly four years in prison for it. He only got a quick hug from his kids at the beginning and end of their visits. When you're an affectionate person to the one you love and your children, like that, that's nothing. Like, that sucks. That's like giving your kids a high five. Like, you don't want to high five your daughters. You know what I'm saying? You want to hold them. You want to cuddle them. He is now on parole until the end of next year and is determined to turn his life around. McGrew works full time for a group called Snug, which is gun spelled backwards, treating gun violence <coughs> like a disease. A lot of these kids is traumatized as far as thinking that is normal. It's nothing normal about losing friends, family members every day early in life. You know, they their lives cut short for guns. Outreach specialist Walik Betts believes something new can help. You separate like if it's a problem going on, you will go in there and you will like extract the person, like you'll separate a person from it. And when you separate them from it, like you get them away from it, of what's going on, then you try to find out what's going on, then you try to change his mind with like consequences and so forth and so on. They trust McGrew, knowing that he survived this tough street resonates with them. They call me about real life situations, not just on street aspect like becoming a father becoming a man trying to do stuff change stuff so because they know i done been through it not everyone agrees with mcgrew's approach to gun violence local activist kevin brown doesn't i think this is something that can be approached like a disease in the traditional sense you know it's more ingrained in american culture local gun shop owner david steinberg said something similar i don't think it's a disease I think some of the people that use them might have mental illness diseases, which should be tracked more, but it's not um, gun ownership or gun usage. It's actually the problem. According to the Centers for Disease Control, gunshots kill almost 40,000 people per year in the U.S. Overall, gun violence is down in Syracuse, but the amount of murder stayed the same. A staggering 18 out of 20 were killed by bullets. Gunshots also injured 125 people, but that number is down too, 25 fewer than 2016. This follows the national trend. Why is Syracuse getting safer? Experts don't have an answer, but one reason could be McGrew treating gun violence as a disease. How he does that depends on the weather, so he welcomes the rainy days. So if it's quiet and empty, that means nobody getting hurt, nobody getting shot, nobody getting stabbed, nobody getting arrested. That's a good day to me. And to all of us, McGrew has no problem owning up to his earlier days. I'm not denying my past. It is what it is. It makes me the man I am today. I'm not ashamed. You know, I'm not proud of everything I've been through, but I'm not ashamed because I am who I am for a reason. My path was set for a reason. And McGrew's path has been working for him so far. I'm Stefan Oliva, reporting for Mornings on the Hill. Like most U.S. cities, Syracuse has a considerable homeless population. And for our next story, Allison Caliguire introduces us to a man whose past inspired him to reach out to others. It all started three years ago with one man making a sandwich. So I started doing that, making sandwiches, me and my wife. 
in the living room table. We kept going out there, going out there. But Alamin Muhammad didn't keep that sandwich to himself. He walked out his front door and into his neighborhood and handed that sandwich to a man living on the street. Or he wasn't coming through here every Saturday, I know that I would be stagnating. Alamin understands what it's like to feel invisible. I was so hungry one time, a girl had a hamburger and she threw it in the garbage. I went in the garbage, she ate out of the garbage can. You know, that's how hungry I was. And when I did that, it seemed like my whole self-esteem went down the drain. It seemed like I, I knew that I was nothing no more in this world. Alamin grew up in Chicago, and by the eighth grade, he was involved in drugs and gangs. He ended up spending 10 years in prison. I seen people die in front of me, uh, several people, a lot of people. I've been in so many funerals in my life, I really, I lost count. He also lost the joy of life. While in prison, Alamin found Islam and realized he needed a change. He would stand in front of the mirror for hours, trying to learn how to smile again. It needs to hurt. You know, I could get headaches like, I'm trying to smile. Like. <laughs> when he got out of jail, Alamin struggled to find housing or work, and he lived on the street for 10 years. But he did have something valuable, a powerful story to tell. His caseworker, and he looked at me eye to eye and he said, you know what, this story you just told me is real powerful and I'm going to work so hard to help you. One day you're going to help a lot of people and share your story. And I looked at him and I was like, I was like, I'm going to help a lot of people. I just live out of, outside. Alamin started taking classes and eventually earned his associate's degree in addiction counseling. That was one of the best times of my life when I got housing. When they told me that we got somewhere you could stay. Now that he's got a home and a job, Alamin is doing what he can to help others, even if it's simply giving them a sandwich and a smile. And it's not about money. All you have to do is give people a smile, shake their hands, and notice them. Because it's really sad and really hurtful when you feel like you're invisible. Walking around every Saturday, Alamin shakes hands, poses for pictures, and gives out hugs. And he isn't alone. Because of Alamin, nearly 100 volunteers show up every Saturday to hand out sandwiches, toiletries, and soup. They even show up during the bitter cold in February and the hot days in July. In the past, I've tried to volunteer at hospitals, the VA, different places. So, But once we came out here, the energy of Alamine and the whole entire community out here was just contagious and addictive. This is my baby right here. I love this man. Because <laughs> regardless if I've been up all night, if I've been up all month, he going to give me the strength to push on and do better. Absolutely. You know, so at the end of the day, like I said, next week I hope I'm better than what I am right now. Absolutely. I believe you too, okay? I know, thank you. Every Saturday, until every homeless person in Syracuse finds a home, you'll find Alamin under this bridge, changing the world one sandwich at a time. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Allison Caliguire. What a wonderful story that was. Yes. And sometimes someone who looks like your average Joe is actually on the cusp of greatness. Next up, Jose Cuevas has a story of someone who fights hard for their dreams, not for himself, but for those most dear to him. This is the story of Anaya. My cookie is stale. Well, oh, she caught it. There you go. <laughs> of her dad, real. Kevin. Proper etiquette if you don't, right? So you have to. The other guy at the table. It's the real way to do it. It's the real way to do it. It's Friday. We got two days that we can just hang out and chill, right? Yeah. Pinky's up. Cheers. To the weekend. Though tea is easy on his stomach. Three, two, up. His workouts are not. Come on! Yes! 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 Come on! Again! Come on! Last one! Harder! Come on! You would think after a tough workout, he'd be enjoying a cold beer. Not be delivering it. Hello, hello. On an average day, you'll have like 30, 30 to 50 kegs. <laughs> Some of them are very heavy. For him, it's all about putting smiles on faces. There's nothing better than going to a, a nice um, restaurant or, let's say, a store that sells just nothing but craft beer, and they're just their eyes light up when they get their new favorite beer. This is the last keg right here. However, his day isn't over. Come on, push, push, you're halfway. 
as he returns for yet another workout. Kevin Van Ostrand isn't working hard in the gym just to stay in shape. He's actually one of the top kickboxers in the country and in the world. In the U.S., I've been number one for a couple of years now. I've been trying to reach out to the world. An opportunity he will soon have as he will compete for the world title. One more person that's in my way, and then I will be able to tell the world I am number one. The road to glory gets him back into his big rig. Take pride in what you do, you know. Don't half-ass anything. If you're going to do it, do it right. It can be difficult when you wear the battle scars of your dreams 24-7. Look at that. It's just, oh, it hurt. He stays positive with a laugh. Today's not free, sorry. <laughs> or two. Then I'm going to be famous after that. Wait, I thought you already were. <laughs> You're famous to me now. Oh, thanks, Todd. See you. And back to the grind. <laughs> Training is all about teamwork, as his trainer does everything Kevin does. When one's down, the other picks you up, and, and it's it's really, it's, it, it's helped Kevin, it's helped everybody involved. Even if the teamwork can be a bit Come on. brutal. Come on. From the pain, he finds inspiration. I can't look bad in front of my kids. I can't. So, no matter what we're doing at the time, whether I'm gassed, hurt, tired, this extra wind comes back in. And I just, I have to push it, push forward. He's traveled thousands of miles in more ways than one. All of the hard work in the gym, in his truck, in pursuit of his purpose. It just reminds me of my why. It reminds me of my kids. You know, who am I doing this for? This isn't just a fight. Let's go! This is an end where you gotta take two but an opportunity to achieve greatness, all at the ring of a bell. lost. But there's one place where he will always be a winner. Hey girls. Daddy! Daddy! Hey girls. How are you? Hey, how are you? Good? Yeah. Yeah. What's next? Just gotta keep pushing forward. That's he is it. back at work That's before it. the sun is. Jose Cuevas for Mornings on the Hill. And still to come on this special edition of Mornings on the Hill. How one man may seem alone, but it's those at the bar that give him a home. Stay with us. Thanks for sticking with us during this special edition of Mornings on the Hill. In his mid-50s, this man has made his mark at the bar. And it may not be what you think. Our next story, you actually brought us, Nicole. I did bring it to you guys, and yes, the bar certainly helped him through his entire life journey, but what's important to remember here is that it's those around us that really get us through. Yeah, that's my life in a book. Larry Crabtree faces the future alone, a first for him, except for some company from a little furry friend, Meet Sugar Bear. She has a lovely arabesque line, actually. <laughs> Before living on Church Street, Larry lived in Midtown Manhattan for over 20 years. He was 21 when he took the train from Syracuse to pursue a career in dance. It started with a lot of small opportunities. One of my first jobs was uh, working with the New York City Jazz Company. But his first week living in Manhattan almost made him leave for good. Yeah, just getting on off the subway at night, heading back to my apartment, and two guys were one guy was in front of me, one guy behind, and put a gun to my neck and pulled me down the staircase. The robbers took with them a family heirloom necklace and the seven dollars in his pocket. Terrified, Larry ran to his apartment, hoping they wouldn't return. 
but luckily that didn't happen. The harder he worked at the bar, the more opportunities. First, it was a scholarship at one of the city's premier studios, then contracts with legendary choreographers. But that came with a price. 60, 80 hour work week all the time. Plus working full time as a restaurant manager in Times Square. Sleep is overrated. <laughs> He switched into teaching after longtime friend Catherine Kingsley convinced him to co-direct Anglo-American Ballet. What am I going to teach? And she's like, you'll figure it out. And I basically did. Rush through. And successfully for almost 25 years. But the New York Minute stopped when his family needed him. It was time for him to come home. And shortly thereafter, mom got sick. Larry became her prime caregiver, visiting her daily in rehab, then to his father, who has the beginning stages of dementia. He said he wanted to dance, so he wanted to take taps, so we took his dress shoes from Easter and put taps on him. Larry's resilience and tireless spirit continued here in the studio. He was teaching aspiring primas, as well as choreographing a production when he found a lump in his neck in 2015. He said, we think you have cancer. I was like, what? I mean, I felt great. But it was cancer, and six months of chemotherapy lied ahead. The doctors advised he take off, but Larry said he'd rather die than stop teaching. Fortunately, I set up 11 classes in four days <laughs> at three locations. <laughs> in my free time, I went for chemo. His students saw him at his worst, at one point dropping 35 pounds. I think Larry, he really kept his chin up during the whole thing, which I think was very helpful for probably everyone around him, like his family and all of us too. His insurance barely covered the bills, so Larry turned to GoFundMe. My campaign picture was me doing abs in a class with this big smile on my face, and that was, that was a, a perfect, Lawrence needs your help, Larry needs your help, and everybody answered. $10,000 quickly became 20000 Students from New York City, from Syracuse, all came to the fore and everything, and it was a, a great blessing. It's been two years cancer-free and back full-time at the bar, although he has a daily reminder of what chemo took from him. Dealing with neuropathy in my feet, which is not fun as a dancer. If his left foot gives, he quickly changes shoes. They do listen occasionally. And then he's back on point. Easy, easy, here we go. If he's always telling us about, you know, you can't be tired because I just came and taught 10 classes at these different places with all these different people. Those students learn more from Larry than just ballet. They learn what it means to live. It kept me alive. My students kept me alive. Larry really isn't alone in this thing called life. The bar brought him into dozens of lives, and those same people are ultimately what saved his. Yeah. One thing, Alexis, that Larry mentions every single class is that it's hard work what gets you to your dream job. And he tells everyone that he lives his dream job every single day. That's such a beautiful story, Nicole. Wow. <laughs> and much more is still ahead on this special edition of Mornings on the Hill. You're about to meet Banana Jack, one little boy's buddy who has a special connection to his best friend. It's a great story. You really don't want to miss it, so stay tuned. Welcome back. This next story shows how some of the strongest bonds we form can come very early here in life. Mornings on the Hill, Karthik Venkantraman recently met two kindergartners who are bananas over each other. Here is their story. Class is in session for the kindergartners of St. Rose of Lima. Kids this stage can be known for monkeying around, but in this classroom, there is a monkey. Banana Jack has perfect attendance. And this Jack? Make sure Banana Jack doesn't get left behind. We're going to computer class. This monkey can be quite the goofball. Sometimes when I'm at my class, Banana Jack just doesn't do his work. He just stares at me. I'm like, Banana Jack, why are you staring at me? You need to do your work. And after working that brain, he sure enjoys lunch. A new student, Banana Jack sits in the same seats every day. And whose monkey is Banana Jack? Kaylee. Kaylee, a kindergartner at St. Rose of Lima, too. 
I have a monkey there when I'm not at school. Because most of the time, she's in the hospital. Kaylee was diagnosed with Wilms tumor, a type of kidney cancer, on her sixth birthday in February. I didn't know that she could be so strong. I try to be that strong for her. It's just hard sometimes. I usually don't cry in front of her because then she gets upset. Kaylee will miss a lot of school as she undergoes aggressive chemotherapy over the next 30 weeks. Sometimes it's, it's like she's not sick and it's easy to get through the day and then sometimes it's why. <laughs> Adversity over a few months has felt I'm sorry. like many years. Banana Jack is part of a program called Monkey in My Chair that helps cancer patients like Kaylee stay connected with their classmates. I think Kaylee's initials. A couple times a week, Kaylee's classmates get together and they make her cards. This one says, I love you, and this one says, I miss you. And then, these cards go in Banana Jack's backpack and go home to Kaylee. This is how much I missed her, 100. And Jack misses her the most. I, and I put a lot of those because that's, I'm being really crazy. That's how much I miss her and that's how much I be crazy about her. His attachment to Banana Jack is more about his attachment to Kaylee. Oh, and the names Banana Jack and Jack, it's no coincidence. Kaylee named the monkey after the boy she is ooh ooh ah ah over. I said, what's your husband's name? What'd you say? Jack. No boy is ever good enough for a father's daughter. But, but even Kaylee's crazy. dad approves. Yeah. No. Kaylee and him are like this, 100%. So, I guess I can't be too mad at him. <laughs> they get to see each other occasionally. Jack visits her at the hospital sometimes. And Kaylee went to his birthday party a week ago. She made me take her out and get her a special outfit for Jack's birthday party. Because <laughs> she's like, and then she woke me up at 6 in the morning. Mom, don't forget, it's Jack's birthday party. When Jack had to pick someone for all of his, like, teams, who did he pick first? Always me. Always you. Together, they're inseparable. But life's cruel ways have forced them to separate. Yeah. yeah. I'm totally sad. Jack and this monkey, they're pals. But it's nothing like Jack and Kaylee's bond. And for Jack, it seems deep down. School without Kaylee's like. One. Um, I just need one more. Minus one equals zero. I'm Karthik Venkatraman, reporting for Mornings on the Hill. Alexis, what a heartwarming story that was. No. It's just an incredible story. And don't worry, we have many more stories coming up for you. Stick with us. I'm Nicole Dementry. I'm Alexis Scott. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to this special edition of Mornings on the Hill. I'm Caitlin Pearson. And I'm Maya Owens. We're featuring stories produced by the Master Storytelling class here at the Newhouse School, taught by Professor Bob Dotson and Les Rose. First up, according to the New York State Department of Education, several schools within the Syracuse City School District are among the lowest achieving public schools in New York State. Sarah Bonides takes us inside one of the district's struggling schools, where a teacher is giving her students a voice. So who are we picking up now? This is Ede. We're going to pick Ede up. Meet Miss S, a Hanegar High School teacher who goes the extra mile, literally, picking up her students for school, or in this case, a first day of work. So how did Miss S help you find this job? Uh, I don't know how she did it, but she did it. <laughs> <laughs> she had yeah. magic. <laughs> yeah, I wish I had magic, you know? She may not have magic, but what she does have is compassion. 
I treat every child as if he or she were my own. Another policy that you guys really, really discussed last week. Acting in place of a parent is something Miss S has been doing for 40 years in the Syracuse City School District and at Henniger High School the next for the past days, 15. I know this is ambitious, but I have high expectations. She doesn't just help students find jobs or pass her class. She provides a helping right. hand. You guys good? You got enough? I think you need some more junk food over there. How are you guys okay? Lends an ear. Whenever I had a problem, I would go to her. Everybody loves her. And does everything she can to help students achieve their goals. But they don't have to be her students or even high school students. It's time she teaches like how to read and read fast and stuff like that. So it's actually fun. Derek is a member of nonprofit soccer league Tilly's Touch and a regular face at the organization's soccer study program. They come in, they play soccer for an hour, hour and a half, and then uh, when Joyce and the tutors show up, then we break off and they do reading. A program spearheaded by Miss S. According to the New York State Department of Education, in 2017, the graduation rate for the Syracuse City School District was just 60 percent, and that is significantly lower than the state average of 80 percent. But out of the students who participated in Tilly's Touch for at least three years, that graduation rate was 100 percent. Johnson says the program's success rate means the organization is making strides when it comes to helping students receive an education, especially when it comes to his refugee students. According to the Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, over the past decade there has been an influx of refugee students entering the Syracuse City School District, a district in a city with one of the highest poverty rates in the nation. A district where Suslovic says many students and their families don't receive the resources that they need. It's a source of frustration for my students um, and for myself. But Miss S encourages her students to not stay silent. It's unfair for the rest of students who speak language other than English, like myself. But despite the unique challenges each student faces in the outside world, inside her classroom is a safe haven. I'm here with Miss Sesselvik every day after school because I feel comfortable here doing my homework and everything else because it's just she's just like a mom. Even long after the school day has ended. But why does she do it all? I love that bond that I have with my students, and I love to see them succeed. Uh, my goal is that each and every student that I teach goes on to do better than I did, which I think I did pretty well, and I want them to do better. Although not every one of Miss S's students graduate or go on to higher education, she gives them one of the most important skills of their lives, a new voice. To speak out. Landlords will also have to pay the district or county for not complying with health regulations. Or in the case of refugee Eid Ahmed, to give thanks. Right here, this is the letter that Eid wrote to me right here. And I keep this. This is when you say, why do you teach? <laughs> That's why I teach right there. A voice that before Miss S couldn't be understood. Now we pick up Ken. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Sarah Bonardis. Now, when many of us think about beauty pageants, we think big makeup, big hair, and intense competition. That's for sure. But one local beauty queen here proves it's about much more than that. Odea Pincus has her story. In life, we all sometimes fall down. Yes, that does include you and me. Even supermodels and beauty queens fall down sometimes. And while we might laugh, we often forget about the work that goes into just standing up in the first place. This is Katie Flaherty, and she's currently Mrs. Onondaga County. But her path to get here has been no cakewalk. If someone had told you like five years ago that you'd be here right now, what would you? <laughs> That's hilarious. No way. No. Throughout her life, Katie has had to work through a number of health complications, some which stem from being born premature. Those complications can make moments in life frustrating. Like when Katie wanted to pick up a new instrument. There's handy dandy strap. <laughs> it's vital to me. She has spinal and neck issues and was turned down by more than one violin teacher 
before finding uh, one that would work with her. Other positions. Okay, we got to kind of customize the shoulder to, 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 to work around that, the arch of the bridge. She's also had a long struggle with anxiety. I never fit anywhere, so I was basically on my own. So I suffered from a lot from depression. Katie applied to be Mrs. Onondaga County, but recently she competed in her very first pageant for the title of Mrs. New York America. Now you can only imagine how stressful it must have been for Katie to get on stage. But before that, she came here to Fit Terrain Studios in North Syracuse, where an international beauty queen, Corinne Stalakis, teaches people to not only talk the talk, but to walk the walk. You, you kind of dragged into position, and everything kind of flows together. And while Stalakis shows her clients how to work the runway, she says that pageantry is more than just evening gowns and swimsuits. Everybody has something that they feel insecure about or that they feel is a flaw or a limitation in their life. And what you're doing is you're kind of giving a voice to that and saying, you know, nobody's perfect. Everybody has something in their life that kind of holds them back or they feel like it holds them back. They feel like it's a limitation. But I'm here just to say, you know, I can do whatever I want to do because I'm a strong woman, I'm a confident woman, and here I am. But sometimes being a voice means that you have to practice your own. And as a part of her training, Katie attended Toastmasters, a club that helps people with their public speaking skills. So for four minutes, Sam is going to be asking questions of Katie Flaherty. And please welcome to the front of the room, Katie Flaherty. Members would ask her questions at the podium to mimic a similar event in the pageant. Katie went back to Toastmasters multiple times and is now an official member. And while the journey to pageantry took weeks and weeks, the pageant itself only took a few hours to crown a winner. It wasn't Katie, but it also wasn't me, and it probably also wasn't you. Which makes sense, because in a way, Katie's story is pretty universal. Because at the end of the day, it's not about how you fell down. It's not even about winning or about losing. It's just about how you got back up again. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Odea Pinkus. What a great story from Odea there. And the Simmons family has been in the lacrosse program since 1924, when Roy Simmons Sr. first played here at Syracuse. It would then go on to be passed down four generations. But 94 years later, it could come to an end. Spring semester is a busy time on campus for any college senior as they juggle their final classes and struggle to find a job. For Ryan Simmons, that pressure is no different. I definitely felt it, but um, you know, it was kind of just something I put on the back burner and just wouldn't think too much about and just kind of um, you know, enjoy what I was doing in the moment. That pressure Ryan feels is not the pressure of just any Syracuse senior. He's the captain of the Syracuse men's lacrosse team. It's the stress of being the leader. Lacrosse is more than just a sport to Ryan, it's in his DNA. I was kind of born into it, I guess, um, but I wasn't forced into it in any way. It just uh, naturally um, kind of grew up watching it and coming to the Dome a lot and uh, being on the sidelines with my grandpa and my dad. The Simmons name has been with Syracuse Lacrosse since 1924, a year in which Calvin Coolidge was president, the 20s were rolling, and Ryan's grandfather picked up his first lacrosse stick but certainly not his last. Far, far from it. Roy Simmons Sr. would then go on to coach more than 250 wins in four decades. And then in 1971, Roy Simmons Jr. would take over for his dad as head coach. It was a time when Nixon was president, the Vietnam War protests were at their height, and Simmons Jr. would lead the Orange to six national championships. Before long, Roy III was playing college across and then coaching here as well. The pressure was passed down with the passion, generation by generation. Here I was, you know, carrying the name of, of Roy III and, and the Simmons name, and, and uh, it, was, it was difficult. I probably put more pressure on myself um, as much as anything. The legacy to play and then coach here may seem simple. It's what the Simmons family does, but it's never expected within the family. Rather, a decision each would make on their own. And, and I pursued my master's in counselor education and, and actually, you know, was able to live out my dream. I became a high school counselor uh, for a number of years and, until my father approached me uh, when, right before he retired and he said, you're going to have one shot at this kid, do you want to come back and coach? Uh, after I had coached for a number of years with him. 
And uh, you know, ultimately, I made the decision to to come back to coaching uh, and leave what was my my identity and my dream, and um, and come back to coaching. And I, I haven't regretted it for a minute. The only person I wanted advice from was my dad. Um, you know, I had great coaches growing up, but at the end of the day, um, you know, the guy across the dinner table was the one I wanted to really impress and. Um, you know, his word was really the only one that mattered at the time. And with the clock counting down, Ryan plans to do something beyond the family business, commercial real estate. I'm kind of hoping it'll take me out west or towards California. I've been there a couple times and we have family out there. Um, so we visited there and every time I go, it's, it's like a whole separate world. It's just so much fun. I kind of fell in love with it. However, being a lacrosse coach is not completely out of the question. You know, initially, I think you know, I kind of got to do something on my own and kind of break from that for a little bit and then maybe come back to you know, the orange path. It's a path that might just extend the Simmons-Syracuse legacy into another century. Tara Lanigan, Mornings on the Hill. Coming up here on Mornings on the Hill, my, what's your favorite meal? Hmm, let me think. I think chicken quesadillas. Actually, cutting up the chicken is so satisfying to me. But you know, I sat down with a woman who's a chef, and one of her favorite parts about cooking is cutting the food, too, despite her disabilities. Welcome back to the special edition of Mornings on the Hill. And our next story is about a local high school basketball senior who has enjoyed much success. And as Sean Robson shows us, this player has an inspiring story both on and off the court. Most high school basketball programs never see a sectional title, let alone a state title. Casey Vaughn, a graduating senior at Jamesville DeWitt High School in Syracuse, has won three state championships over the last five years, including one Federation Cup. And, you know, we try to keep them grounded to make them understand that, you know, this is not normal. This is completely abnormal. And you know. It all began with Casey at a very young age. Her parents can recall the moments vividly. I wasn't even paying attention, but she had found a basketball and we were, you know, doing drills on one end of the floor. And next thing I know, he just people, the other coaches, like pointing down the, down the court, just watching her, just kind of try to heave the ball up towards the basket. When I took her sisters to swim practice, she was two. She was dribbling. She was dribbling on the, on the pavement while the kids were in, her sisters were in swim practice. A true point guard, a facilitator, the one that makes her teammates' lives easier. In the midst of constant success on the court, her most important assist never came on the hardwood was in the hospital room looking at her mom. I couldn't even go into the hospital room. I saw one peek through the curtains and it looked like she was dead. October 28, 2016, Casey's mother suffered a brain aneurysm that would leave her both physically and mentally disabled. PJ lost her memory for more than two months and over 40 pounds. She now struggles with balance and a frozen shoulder. Thanks, honey. For a brief moment, the choice between mom and basketball became the hardest decision of her life. She saved me. Casey, she saved me. She helps me get in and out of the car. I mean, stupid, stupid little things that you don't think you need help with. She helps me get dressed. She's helped me in the shower, you know, to shampoo my hair. She takes a chair and like stands over the shower. Just... With parents divorced and both of her older sisters moved out, Casey has taken over the role of mom in the family. Pretty soon basketball became Casey's only escape. And I, I've never looked forward to basketball practice more in my life, just because I knew just being around my team and the coaches and playing basketball, which I love for two hours, could help me forget about my, like, my reality of what was actually going on. And, you know, she told me that about her mom and, you know, we kind of shut basketball down and, you know, the t you know, it was a couple weeks before the season. And I'm like, you know, mom's more important, you know, she's worried about the team already. I mean, it, she's worried about mom, obviously, but she's worried, well, I, I think I can make, I'm like, case. And it hasn't gotten any easier. Just this past October, PJ was diagnosed with yet another aneurysm, one that took her out of work indefinitely. The balance between mom and basketball has grown all the more delicate. Casey contacts her mom nearly every hour after she leaves the house. Are you okay? She waits for me to text her back. How is that for a senior in high school to feel like she's checking in? 
It's like she has a baby at home and she's checking to make sure the baby's okay. I, stuff a kid shouldn't have to do. She should be out with her friends. And not stuck with me. And maybe that's why PJ said something to her daughter that no other mom would. Instead of Casey staying home to take care of her, she wants her to go. I know she's even said she doesn't want to play basketball, but I think that's because she wants to stay in a school around here, and I don't want her to do that. Her leadership on and off the court is evident. If playing in college never comes to be, she'll likely find her way to the bench in a different role. She's going to be a coach someday, somewhere, somehow, wherever that is. Um, but she needs to continue playing because she needs that, you know, that grouping of people. Um, you know, coaching, whether it's basketball or life or whatever, um, you know, she's a one-in-a-lifetime kid. She really is. Um. She even coached a JV girls summer league basketball team as a junior in high school. I mean, I sit back at that and I just, you know, it just brings a smile to my face. It's that wide, you know, because, and then the parents are coming up to me and they're saying, you know, the girls just love playing for Casey. Casey is not anxious about her future because she knows that life is seldom what we plan. You know, being able to just go to the grocery store with her again, like all those little things that before I'd take for granted, but now I realize like how much they mean to me. Because as her mom once told her, life is short and one day you may need a cane. Yep, yep, she is my cane, yep. Always will be, even if I hopefully get to lose my cane someday, she will always be my cane. Yeah. Someone to lean on. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Sean Robson. For many disabled people, finding job opportunities is a challenge. And a Cornell study found less than 10% of disabled adults in New York State are fully employed. Recently, I had the chance to tell the story of one woman who's not letting her disability define her, but instead she's using it to her advantage. There's something special about this fridge. It's filled with memories, enough to feed a family of 12, 10 of them adopted. I was the first baby mm. that they had. Brittany looked like her parents. This baby looks like a Grealish. A family who cherished strangers. So you know in school when they ask you, who's your hero? And you kid, Superman, Spider. You know, kids are coming up with all these like movie stars and things. I was like, no, my mother who cared for a sister born with a genetic disorder, can't read or write. She's full of life and energy and she's a trip. Smart and caring too. Experiment on her because she ate everything. Even if some of it didn't taste good. And it sometimes would be nasty when it was little, when I was little. And she'd eat it, she'd eat it and you'd see the look on her poor face. And then she'd run and get water. Passing two other brothers who also look like Grealish's. Well, maybe not. In a house full of diversity, the Grealish kids look towards their father for guidance. To a horrible car accident mm -hmm. and almost died and became a quadriplegic. Mm -hmm. So he broke, the, he broke the second vertebrae okay. in his neck. And so he was in a wheel, his wheelchair bound for the rest of his life. They helped them find happiness among hate. People weren't always friendly to us about, you know, restaurants or medical care for my baby brother when he was an infant. Nurse wouldn't touch him thinking he has AIDS. There are over 135,000 children just like him, adopted every year looking for a home. Each child's story different. And this story isn't among the norm. Brittany was born with just one toe on each foot. And one finger on each hand. That's all she needed to become a successful chef. Her favorite dishes grow out of family stories. So my father, Charles, and he called it green spaghetti. Her father always made this meal for her, even after he lost the use of some of his fingers in a car accident. And whack, 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 but this is his, one of his favorite recipes and it's one of my favorites. And he used to make this for me on my birthday every year. That's where her love of cooking came from. Her father created this very recipe. You know, every night my father cooked, he, I was in there watching him. That's how I learned. You know, I, I've always been that visual learner, so I need to see everything that people are doing so I can figure out how I have to do it. Another favorite came from a neighbor whose husband died, and the Grealish kids would shovel her driveway. 
she's coming. We're all at the door with our faces pressed on it, and it's cold. So my mom's like, don't open the door yet. Outside stood a woman holding a tray of bread. For Brittany, food is more than something to eat. These dishes are cherished memories. I know they're pretty simple, but this is what my daddy always made me for my birthday. And this was always what we got during winter from our neighbors. So, Family, love, and two fingers are all she needs to make a full meal. Now, Brittany is continuing to find ways to expand her business, and currently she's looking to create a storefront that will feature some of her favorite meals. That was a great story, Mai. Thanks so much for that. And still to come on this special edition of Mornings on the Hill, laughing to make a difference. Find out how one student comedian is holding audiences in ways you may not expect. That story and more don't go away. Welcome back to a special edition of Mornings on the Hill. And I don't know about you, Caitlin, but there is nothing quite like the feeling of going to a stand-up comedy show <laughs> and laughing all night long. That is so true, Mai. And I had the chance to meet a comedian here at Syracuse who is using her stand-up to show us that what makes us different is what makes us truly shine. Picture yourself being a woman, a black woman, and a Muslim. Triple threat, if you will. <laughs> 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 Gufran Salih is a 20-year-old born in Chicago to two immigrant parents who had immigrated from Sudan. Mom taught Gufran how to survive in strange surroundings. I could always see myself in her, and there's not a lot of people that I can look up to as role models that look like me, talk like me, act like me, except for my mom, and she's, oh, she's just amazing. Her mother made sure Gufran felt comfortable with herself and her community. Then one day, that confidence shattered. And then sophomore year, I moved to Dallas where my grandparents live and oh my God, that was a flip. I live in a rural conservative town and I sit there and I'm like, oh no. Her parents moved to Malaysia. Gufran had to find a way to thrive. And she did so in an unexpected way by making a statement with her non-traditional yearbook quote. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> no, this isn't real. The quote says, I got a haircut and no one noticed, and was retweeted 700,000 times. This is like actually from her yearbook. <laughs> However, high school is not always full of laughter. One day, a student ripped off Gufran's scarf and threw it onto the floor. This was just days after the ISIS terrorist attacks in Paris and it left Gufran screaming. It was a very long pause of no one knowing what to do. So I picked up my scarf and I walked into the bathroom. I didn't look back. The story didn't end there. She was home for winter break and that same student showed up at her doorstep. He sat in front of me and he apologized. And I think that the fact that he apologized just made my heart just so happy. Gufran savored the unexpected kindness. Comedy had overcome ignorance. I'm patient with people laughing at my jokes, and <laughs> I think that, that comedy is kind of the way that I've always seen people in my life deal with things and the way that I've dealt with things. And to point it out in comedy is still pointing it out and informing people. And when people laugh, they listen. That's the thing. Everyone loves comedians because they like laughing at them, but they also hear the message behind their comedy. One of those individuals who laughed at her jokes was fellow sophomore Aaron Govley. So both of us actually found that we had way more in common than uh, appearances would dictate, and that's part of why we're really good friends. She realized Gufran's comedy helped her to see more than their differences and was the kind that would get people to lift up their cell phones. One of my favorite jokes that she tells is how like she was asked if she showers with her hijab on. One time, no, actually not one time, seven times, I'm 20 years old, seven times in my life I have been asked, Gufran, do you shower with your scarf on? <laughs> <laughs> what? No, 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 no. <laughs> no. She was also asked if she has ears. Plus, here's the hot take. Oh! Um, but it also makes her, uh, you know, whether 
she doesn't have to be, but when she chooses to be, it makes her an ambassador for things that people don't understand. Because comedy is way more approachable than um, you know, just walking up to someone who's different than you and saying, why are you like this? Comedy allows people who don't know anything about the things that kind of shape Gufran's identity, it makes her approachable to, to get to know that like a black Muslim woman can be this driven, ambitious, um, like heartfelt person. The ultimate outsider is now doing something rare, running for president of Syracuse University's Student Association. Why I say, like, I'll tell you our slogan, why not now? Will comedy play a role in her campaign? I don't know if I'm allowed to, but I'm probably going to do it anyway. <laughs> I feel like comedy is just a part of my personality. And if I truly do want the students to see all parts of me and how I'm going to serve them, comedy is definitely going to be one of those things. Win or lose, <laughs> Gufran says the biggest battle she faces every day is getting someone to smile. Everyone's going to get knocked down sometimes. And sometimes you're going to have to face it alone. So it's really important to find something in yourself that you're like, that's, that's it. That's your why. What's your why? What's why? Laughter is the shortest distance between people, making our differences not so different after all. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> for Mornings on the Hill, I'm Caitlin Pearson. Now, Gufran always gets a lot of laughs and applause at her stand-up comedy shows, but she also got a lot of votes during the essay election here where she was elected president of the Student Association. And my, she says she plans to keep the students laughing with her all throughout her term here. Wow, Caitlin, what a great story. And that's it for this special edition of Mornings on the Hill. I'm Mai Owens. Our thanks to the students of the Master Storytelling class here at the Newhouse School. And their professors, Bob Dotson and Les Rose. I'm Caitlin Pearson. Thanks for watching.